Thanks all for coming today, um, and, I, and I hope that the, the, the question has been one that's um, intrigued you a little bit. Um, but but what, I'd, what I'd like to start off with is, is, is a remark about something that happened this week. Um, the, the NASA announcement a few days ago about the discovery of some possibly Earth-sized exoplanets reminded me of my lifelong fascination with Star Trek, and in particular, the captain's injunctions to seek out new life and new civilizations. Well, it was these same feelings that led me to the study of the past, specifically the Middle Ages. And so that's, that's roughly the period from about 500 to 1500, and most of the examples I'll be talking about today concern um, the central part of that period. There was something about the proximity of the Middle Ages. There's a sort of temporal neighborliness, at least as far as the span of human existence is concerned. Medieval people are in a way easier to get to know than Australopithecus because they left written records. We, we simply know more about them. They used languages we still know. They had laws, careers, loves, battles, tragedies, and hopes. But there's also a sense of distance as well, and mystery, and that adventure into the unknown. There's so much we don't know, and there's so much that's culturally different from today. For instance, kings and lords as a matter of course, grand institutions of faith, and of course, no electricity and no internet. Today's question might, might seem um, to have a bit of an obvious answer. Of course, there was history in the Middle Ages. Things happened, didn't they? But my question for today is slightly different, because what I'm interested in is whether writers in the Middle Ages thought that what they were writing was history. And the answer to that is not quite as clear. So as, as Spock had puzzled over alien races on Star Trek, coming to the conclusion, well, th there's life, but not as we know it, I would say that there was indeed history, but not quite as we know it. So there, there are three problems I'd like to point out in our search for history in the Middle Ages. Firstly, you couldn't study it at university. Some of the earliest universities sprang up in the 11th and 12th century, including Paris and Bologna, and of course this illustrious university. And the, the classic liberal arts that one could study included the, the trivium, or grammar, logic, and rhetoric and the quadrivium, which included music, astronomy, arithmetic, and geomet geometry. And, and the point here is that education was much more about patterns than content. The idea was that truth would be arrived at through the intersection of different ways of thinking. An education then didn't constitute learning about ideas, but learning to think with them. So the events of the past and things that happened were tools with which to do so and not necessarily ends in and of themselves. The second problem with the idea of history in the Middle Ages as opposed to today is that history wasn't all in the past. It was, for instance, it was often um, frequently something that you would find in history that, that matters in the future would be discussed just as frequently as matters in the past. Prophecy was a normal feature of writing about the past. So if we consider William of Malmesbury writing in the 12th century about King Edward the Confessor of Anglo-Saxon England on the eve of the Norman Conquest, William reported the king's prophecies of disaster as though this really was an accurate premonition of the events of the Norman Conquest itself. Now, if I tried to write a book on the basis that I had heard a prophecy that all of my arguments were true, I can assure you that I wouldn't get a, a book contract. <laughs> the other issue here is, is that history was, was also largely about the present. There were those in the Middle Ages who said that to write history, to use the term historia, could only be a record of things which had been seen to occur. So this is really quite limiting. I mean, if you had seen it, um, and if, if, if you hadn't seen something and you were relying on the testimony of others, you could write something about the past, but it wasn't going to be history. So ironically for us, we often think of history as the past, even the distant past. In a way, according to this school of thought, you could only write history about the present, things you had seen firsthand within your own living memory.
And if you weren't, if, if you're writing about things farther in the past, what you'd be doing was using the stories of others to share lessons for the present based on past events. And this leads me into the third problem with, with the search for history in the Middle Ages, which was that indeed writing about the past wasn't necessarily writing history as we know it today. Some, for instance, the early medieval writer Arotius wrote in order to discover God's hidden plan. So the interest wasn't in human events, but how the things that played out in this world are actually evidence for a, a more real, a more true spiritual world. And some wrote about, about the past only in so far as they might glorify a king, or on the other hand, to provide him with moral examples drawn from past, of, past events to help him lead a, 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 just, um, a just reign and personal life. But there are, I think, some, some solutions here and some ways in which writing about the past and writing history in the Middle Ages aren't in fact so different from today. Because what I would suggest is that the desires that motivated recording the past are indeed a bit more familiar and in line with, with motivations for historians today. So first here is the attempt at ob objectivity. Arotius again spoke about a watchtower as the ideal place for the historian, stressing the importance of perspective and distance. The historian could only write about the past if he were at a distance, as in at the top of a watchtower, from the events he was describing. And this kind of rhetoric about distance and perspective, objectivity, is something that we find in writing history and indeed in the sciences today. A second connection between the motivations of then and now um, is, is simply the, the, the element of personal interest and curiosity. For instance, the extensive monastic library holdings, marginal notes made on historian sources, and the exchange of letters between monks writing about the past in different places, all of these convey a sense of personal fascination and simple excitement about writing history. And, 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 and the third one, and perhaps the most important, is simply the fear of oblivion. And it's especially in an age when written material um, was not as prevalent as today, history was very much not an ivory tower pursuit. It was not the writing of a coffee table book or a book to be sold in an airport bookshop. This was a rescue mission to be practiced by an elite and highly trained community of writers, mostly monks, but also poets. These writers were the first line of defense of the past. And as William of Malmesbury wrote, he was motivated by the love of his own country to mend the broken chain of history and try to fill in the gaps that would otherwise be lost to human memory. And I'd like to also make a comment on the idea of truth, because the distinction between truth and fiction in the Middle Ages was not necessarily one of opposites, and this point is less outlandish than it might seem. Consider, for instance, this seemingly factual extract from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle for the 10th century. Entry for the year 994. King Olaf promised King Ethelred that he would never come back to the English race in hostility. 995. Here in this year, the comet star appeared and Archbishop Sigeric passed away. 996. In this year, Elf Elfrich was consecrated as Archbishop. 997. In this year, the raiding army raided, slaughtered, and brought the war booty to their ships. Now, these might sound like facts, and they might be true in the sense of being verifiable from outside sources. But is it history? There are no causal links. There are no attempt, there's no attempt to ask any why questions. We don't know why Olaf agreed here, and we don't know how people felt about the raiding army. Um, Yet the account is still valuable as part of the historical record and an insight into what people thought was worth recording in the past, perhaps as reminders for feelings otherwise lost to us. And, and, and the comet here is, is, could, could and perhaps be a bit of familiarity as well, because who knows how these exoplanets might affect our historical narratives in the future. Might the concept of global history stop being simply an approach and perhaps a way of distinguishing human experience from the experience in other star systems? And on the fictional side, I'd like you to consider this, this segment from a 12th century chronicle by Henry of Huntington. He completely fictionally invented an account of the words that William the Conqueror said to his soldiers on the eve of the Battle of Hastings. 
William the Conqueror apparently said, it is shameful um, that King Harold has broken the oath he made to me in your presence. Raise your standards, men. Let there be no measure or moderation to your righteous anger. Let the lightning of your glory be seen from east to west and the thunder of your charge be heard and may you be the avengers of most noble blood. Now, writers invented these pre-battle orations and they might seem completely fictional and propaganda, but these, these would be included in a history in the Middle Ages if the writer thought it captured an element of the experience on the ground. So Harold's oath might be a complete fiction, but if Henry of Huntingdon thought that William's men had fought hard and bravely because they were roused to action by spirited words and by what they thought was a noble cause, this speech might indeed convey more of a sense of truth than the simple fact on October 14th, 1066, William won the battle at Hastings. So it is history, but not as we know it, similar to the comment, the sort of famed comment from Star Trek, it's life, but not as we know it. You know, I think one of the great lessons from Star Trek is the promise of finding understanding of and sympathy with unknown peoples. There were more shared desires, likewise, in the recording of the past in the Middle Ages um, and today than we might think. For instance, this is a talk about history, yet I have framed it with a reference to fiction and with reference to the movements of the stars and planets. And now I'm going to conclude with a reference to the future, which is that I hope you will reflect on the nature of getting at historical truth then and now, slightly differently after having heard today's talk. Perhaps the future and the past are not so different after all. And what I would say is that as sure as there was life in the Middle Ages, so too there was history. Thank you very much.